Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program as we welcome Linda Lawson to the show. Uh, Linda is a state 4-H youth development specialist with the 4-H Center for Youth Development at the University of Missouri, and she helps lead the 4-H Life Program, a program for children of offenders and their families. We're going to talk about that program on today's podcast. Thanks for joining us, Linda. Thanks. Glad to be here. So I was really fascinated about this program when I learned about it, and I, I want to send a shout out to our EdTech uh, Learning Network. Uh, uh, someone on the Learning Network uh, let me know about the work that you're doing, and I think it's it's really important work. Uh, maybe we could start with talking about what uh, the f- what a 4-H life visit is like to a correctional facility, and that might help us get a little bit better idea of, of the program as a whole, too. Okay. Well, initially 4-H Life began um, as a response to improving family relationships for kids whose parents are in prison. And, um, you know, kids do go visit their parents in prison, and it's not always a situation where it's conducive to building family relationships and for kids to be comfortable with their family and, um, and for the incarcerated parent or other family member to visit with the kids and just really help them through their life. So, um, basically, it began kind of out of, of that need is to um, improve that relationship because um, when kids visit the prison in what we call traditional setting, um, there's no uh, cross visiting with other family members uh, from, you know, with other incarcerated families, uh, family member. And there's also um, the kids have to keep their hands on the table and there could be a play area in the visiting room, that kind of thing. So it's just a situation where kids uh, typically over time, they don't want to go visit just because it's such a restrictive environment. And of course, corrections does that because, you know, their, their primary need is safety and security of the institution and that kind of thing. But um, so uh, because of some inside uh, knowledge, we, we're able to start the 4-H Life program, and we started what um, was called enhanced visitation. And essentially, um, the corrections reduced, uh, relaxed some of the visiting room rules, and we were able to do some hands-on activities, much like we would do in any 4-H um, group setting. And um, and it's just a better thing for the kids to be able to visit with their family member and for them to be able to have some conversations and um, maybe even have a little more physical interaction, just um, as simple as just um, the father putting the arm around the child or the mother giving the kids a hug. So that's kind of the nutshell of, of how it uh um, what the what the need was right and, and the need sort of ex- extends also to sort of some of the risks that the kids face at you know because of being uh the the child of an offender um mm-hmm. right uh, in the reading I, I think that that's mm-hmm. what you guys found right well, now there's been some uh you know we've worked with a statistic that says that um children whose parents are um, are incarcerated are, you know, five to six times more likely to be um, incarcerated themselves. And um, there's been some recent research that that's not really the case. Uh, in some ways, they um, experience some of the same risk factors that any child would, you know, uh, whatever's going on in the environment, uh, you know, is a risk factor for the children. And this is a risk factor, obviously. Um, you know, there's, you know, lots of reasons why people are incarcerated. And so, those situations in the community where the children live can cause that. So it's not just exclusively the fact that their parent becomes incarcerated, but um, they do have um, needs that, um, you know, they're kind of an invisible population. Lots of times there's uh, a stigma associated with it and the kids don't want to talk about it and the parents keep it quiet and, and that kind of thing. So um, it's just a, uh, 4-H Life gives the kids an opportunity to understand that there's other kids in the same situation they are and that we're there to help them, um, you know, reduce some of these risk factors that they may be experiencing. And then also the incarcerated parent has the opportunity to help steer the children in a direction that is more positive because obviously they've, you know, made some mistakes in their lives and they certainly don't want their children to do the same thing. Right. So let's talk about how the program got started. You, uh, if I read it right, you, you were working at a county level when the program kind of got off the ground? or Yes. I was a 4-H Youth Development Specialist in um, three counties that are just uh, 
uh, south of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, in these three counties, um, there are three correctional facilities in um, two um, in two of these counties. And I lived in one of the communities where uh, a maximum security prison was opened in 1989. And I recall that the community was pretty excited about it because it was a poor uh, job market at that time. And so they felt like it would bring some uh, jobs to the community, which it did. But, you know, typically people aren't excited about a prison coming into their community. So, but um, I had worked as a program assistant and um, my supervisor retired and I was able to shift to be a uh, youth specialist. And so I replaced, uh, needed to refill the position that I vacated as a program assistant. So I hired this woman that um, was originally from Massachusetts and she, nobody in the community knew her, you know, typically sometimes in small communities, you know, you know, people who are interested in the position, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, I chose to hire that person, you know, and um, so the day I made the job offer to her, my colleague came to me and said, do you know that she is married to a person on death row at, you know, the correctional center? And I said, well, no, I didn't. And to be honest, I did freak out a little bit because certainly, you know, we work in extension communities and we have concern about, you know, what our constituents and what our partners are going to think about things. But um, I just recently had an affirmative action training and I'm like, well, this is irrelevant to her job skills and what her job duties are. So, um, so she came to work for uh, University of Missouri Extension, did an outstanding job. And then um, on the day of about her six month, um, probation time, she said, I have something to tell you. And I said, I already know. <laughs> so it was a kind of an interesting thing. So, um, you know, not something that I ever, you know, really thought about or anything, but, you know, began to learn a little bit more about what it's like when families visit a family member in prison and so forth. So, um, this person's husband was, um, she, um, he was pretty involved, you know, after the crime and, um, people come to prison and, you know, they have, you know, then they understand. And so they, they make a turn, even though they're in prison and that kind of thing. And they want to do what they can to, um, you know, improve their lives and their family's lives, even though there's been damage. But, uh, so, so the conversation came up about, um, you know, the visiting room that I mentioned. And, um, so, uh, so this, my colleague said, why don't we start a 4-H club there? Because 4-H is a family strengthening program. Um, it impacts all pieces of the family. You know, we've all been to the steer shows and, you know, the county exhibit days and all those kinds of things. And, the, you know, the whole family's there. And so 4-H does have that impact on families, no matter um, where we work. So I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we began to work with the um, correctional staff there at Potosi Correctional Center. And, um, you know, at that time, um, reentry was becoming a big uh, push by corrections, you know, nationwide, is that, uh, you know, they're just incarcerating more and more people and um, people get out of prison and then they go back. So they wanted to reduce the recidivism rate. And so um, they felt like um, a program like this might help uh, people who've been in prison be able to make um, better connections with the community. And then when they return, they'd have better networks when they returned home. So it was really kind of a good timing. It's all just very serendipitous. And so that's, that's kind of how we started it. And um, we started at a, the Tosi Correctional Center's a max, maximum security facility with, at that time it had, um, you know, mostly um, capital punishment, life without and life without parole sentences, and then, you know, long-term sentences, probably greater than 15 years. So we started there and people ask us, say, well, why would you start at a program like that where people aren't going to get out of prison very soon or if ever? So the thought was, and it turned out to be true, is that because we started it at an institution where these men didn't, weren't going to have any opportunity to have interaction with their children, at least even while they were children, you know, young, that they really were dedicated to make sure that this program worked and um, to make sure that they were able to have these connections to their family. So um, we did some research to see if there were any other programs for children of offenders around the country that, you know, maybe we could glean some information from. But um, most of the things were uh, for kids who lived in a community. So there were support groups. So there were support groups for the community caregiver, the mothers or 
um, or there would be parenting classes for the people who were in prison, but then there wasn't any opportunity for them to interact with their families and that kind of thing. So really 4-H Life brought together all three of those pieces, um, the incarcerated parent, the children, and the community caregivers, whether it be the mothers or you know, fathers or grandmothers or aunts or whomever that may be. So um, much like 4-H is. So that's kind of how it started. And um, we felt like, um, you know, we did glean some information from some other nationwide programs. And uh, so that's kind of how um, we designed it. So we, you know, in the beginning, there were a few little changes, but um, we, at first, we're going to have a um, side parenting classes for the caregivers, but we didn't do that because they wanted to be involved in what was going on um, at the regular 4-H life meetings. Mm. So, so did you face any resistance, criticism, even just concern? I mean, you mentioned starting at a maximum security facility. I, I mean, I, I assume people had to naturally be a little bit apprehensive about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think, um, you know, certainly Extension does lots of programming and um, corrections. You know, there's Master Gardeners um, does that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I've had coworkers who've done parenting classes in correctional facilities or jails and that kind of thing. But um, the first thought by some of the people in the community is they misunderstood and they thought that maybe um, the dads would be coming to the county fair and showing steers. And so that was, you know, they a valid concern and um but certainly you know corrections was not going to allow these men to be out of the um, prison or that kind of thing but um they and then the, the two you know thinking about how extension goes they were also concerned about the resources you know um are restricted county resources going to go to support this um particular program because um not as much now but at that time it was considered that it was um you know, giving special privileges to people who are incarcerated. And we had to continually remind people that even though there's a lot of interaction with the um, parents who are incarcerated, um, the parent, the program is not directly for them. It's really directly for the children. And, um, you know, anytime though that you can improve the skills of a parent and parenting and that kind of thing, then it's a good impact on the children. So, so yes, there was some um, pretty ugly times in the community, but through a very strong state 4-H leader um, and, uh, a committee that was set up in the county and some different things, then um, it, you know, it went ahead and went. And um, we had some children, youth, and families at risk funding. And so, um, and that helped, you know, on the resources question. But I think sometimes in extension, we have grant programs and we work in communities. And I'm thinking about in particular 4-H, but we don't call it 4-H. And so, again, back to this affirmative action, you know, I was like, no, it is a 4-H club. We're going to call it 4-H and we're not going to, you know, hide it or, you know, put it under a rug or anything like that. And really, um, you know, thinking about the initiative of this, uh, you know, being innovative is that made a big difference to go ahead and do that because, you know, certainly I was doing other programs and, you know, trying to start some after school and whenever a school administrator may say, well, I'm not sure this will work in the after school setting. We say, well, it works at um, the prison. <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of a, you know, a thing that really did help move 4-H forward in our area because, you know, that took away a lot of excuses to, you know, to say, I mean, truly 4-H does work in lots of settings and, and um, the correctional facilities are no exception. So s since uh, that start, the program has expanded. You want to talk a little bit about how it's expanded and uh, is, is there, I know it's expanded to some women's facilities. Uh, maybe how is the, if at all, is the program different in any ways in those facilities, maybe lower security facilities mm -hmm. than it is uh, uh, where you started? Okay. Um, actually, this coming Saturday is the 17th anniversary of the first meeting at Potosi Correctional Center on um, March 25th. And um, we ran the program there for mm, five years just as the, as the only place, kind of a pilot project under this Children, Youth, and Families at Risk grant. And um, then we expanded it to the, there are two women's prisons in uh, Missouri, and they are at those institutions. And at this time, we also have it in two other male institutions for a, a total of five um, correctional facilities, state correctional facilities here in Missouri. And... Um, through the 4-H National Mentoring Grant, um, Missouri is, um, gives advice to other states as they start the program. And uh, Louisiana has a program in jails. And uh, New Hampshire has had the program um, at the jails in their state. 
also in District of Columbia, and then in Louisiana and Georgia, the program is um, in what we call a reverse model in juvenile detention centers where um, you know, the, the kids are in detention and then their parents come to what we call the family life visiting day. Um, and one site that we have in Missouri that I'm pretty excited about, it's been there for about three years, um, county um, circuit judges can, uh, people can choose to take what's called drug court. And I think that's pretty well around the country now. But as part of completing their sentence, they can choose uh, what to be involved in. And this is in Cass County. It's just south of Kansas City. And um, uh, they can choose 4-H life as drug court. So their whole family participates in it. And it helps um, connect uh, them to the community and their kids get some positive experiences. And again, they have parenting classes um, that the person that's adjudicated and then also um, the other family member parent and then the children, they're all in that. They do community service. So that's a pretty exciting expansion of 4-H life that we have that um, is also developed here in Missouri. Can you talk about some of the curriculum and resources that have kind of built up around the program and are they particularly different than you know, say like the parenting class, are they particularly different than our parenting classes we would offer to, you know, people who are not, not incarcerated or don't have a family member incarcerated? Mm -hmm. I would say um, we here in Missouri have a curriculum called Building, uh, Building Strong Families, and it has an adult and a youth component, and it um, builds on family strengths, which is um, – uh, other states have similar curriculum, but it's a 13 modules, you know, uh, what are family strengths, communication, responsibility, and, you know, some real basics about child care and uh, managing money and, um, you know, keeping your home healthy and that kind of thing. So that is our foundation curriculum that we use here in Missouri and other states use it as well when they um, deliver 4-H life. Uh, the, um, and then, what I like about our particular curriculum is that it has a youth component. So um, in programs as they mature, you know, the, um, the incarcerated parents um, continue on. So if some, some prisons have programs and you do a six week and you get a certificate and you're out. But uh, in 4-H life, uh, uh, people who are incarcerated can continue on in it, you know, just like they could in any other extension program. So the great thing about that particular curriculum is that we can have some of the offenders also help deliver the education to other, you know, incoming new family members, uh, incarcerated parents. And then also because of the youth curriculum, there's some uh, suitable activities that they can deliver. So if we do child self-esteem, then they can take the youth module of self-esteem and do those activities when we have our 4-H life family days. So, so that's our foundation curriculum. Other states use some other things, but here in Missouri, that's our main one. Um, and really, I mean, there's some exceptions that you have to make because you programming corrections, you know, there's some um, supplies that you can't bring in the prison. And so that is a unique thing about this program. You have to learn um, what's acceptable and what's not and how to go through um, the steps to get, things approved to take into the prison. So, uh, so it must have been a somewhat of a challenge to work with the correctional facilities. I mean, was there a lot of bureaucracy? Did it take a lot of time to sort of work through those kinks in order to get the program into the facilities? Well, for the pilot program, um, it was, a, it was pretty quick from the time we proposed the idea until our first meeting was only five months. And honestly, in extension programming, that's pretty fast. And in particular, um, working with correctional facilities and that kind of thing. But um, they were eager because of reentry to, you know, begin to have some programming for that. But for our programs that continue, um, and I'm thinking about our states that are replicating the program, um, they typically already have some kind of a relationship with um, the jails or the juvenile facilities or something like that. And um, uh, certainly safety and security is the main thing that they care about. So we have to follow those guidelines and um, become uh, volunteers in their system. So we have kind of a dual enrollment, um, dual recognition, um, and to get uh, clearance and understand the protocol and all those kinds of things of the prison. So, um, and the uh, wardens, you know, they have, uh, you know, jurisdiction over what kind of programs they want. Certainly a, a corrections director can give guidance, but um, there's still some, a lot of jurisdiction that is by the um, the war, uh, particular wardens at wherever the institutions are, or certainly in county jails and that kind of thing. So, yeah. 
Yes, it's not always easy. I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I, I was just. I, I can't sugarcoat it, I suppose, but. Um, right. Yeah, I was just reminded of um, as I was thinking about this because I wanted to ask about some of the other states who've adopted it, and it. You know, it, I'll get to that question in a second, but I, I was just reminded of, of working with my work with Military Families Learning Network is that mm. uh, sometimes we don't think about our military bases as a population because not everybody has a military base, um, right. right, in their county or, or even in their state necessarily. Um, and so I wonder if this is similar. Is like, is that where it's being adopted? Is sort of counties where, oh, we've got a facility here. It's sort of right in front of us. Um, or states that have, you know, either higher incarceration numbers or, or more facilities or those kinds of things. Is that where it seems to be being adopted? Mm -hmm. Well, it, uh, I think a lot of it, too, kind of depends on um, the kind of the passions of the people who are working in a particular community. Um, certainly, you know, you can't start a 4-H life program at a correctional center if it's not, you know, not one locally or something like that. But certainly every county has a jail of some sort. And um, so, so sure, you can uh, have them in jails and that kind of thing. And as you said, there are a lot of parallels to the military families. And, um, of course, uh, the, the situation of the children who have a parent who's deployed and a child who has a parent who's incarcerated, um, people just have different perceptions about that. But the difference is, I mean, the similarity is, is that the children have no control over either of those situations, whether parents deployed or whether their parents incarcerated. And so we do use um, a lot of the materials that are from um, the military partnership that, um, you know, has been developed um, at the national level. And just a lot of those resources translate very well to working with kids whose parents are in prison. Yeah, that, that's such a great point. And I remember it and looking at your guys' website is something, you know, we all have our preconceptions or potential stigmas around this. But um, if you just keep that in mind that the kids don't have control of the situation, they didn't choose to be in this situation. I think that's, uh, that's powerful to think about. Right. And then over the course of the years, you know, um, you become to know a lot of the kids and the families and um, kids love their parents no matter where or what they've done. Um, because, you know, much like our curriculum, Building Strong Family says, and every family has strengths. And then that's, you know, one of the things that I've really learned over the years um, in working with this program is that those families love each other and um, they do what they can to, you know, help make it better for their kids. Right. So, so do you have any idea uh, when uh, your colleague, um, you know, proposed this 4-H club in, uh, in, a, in a prison that it would you'd be in five facilities and it'd be happening in all these other kinds of states? Did you kind of see that potential or were you just focused on, you know, what was in front of you? Well, mostly just ne had no idea that it would um, become known across the country and <clears throat> people want to replicate it and that kind of thing. So it was, you know, a need that we knew was immediate and we worked with it. And um, I do admit that I like to do things that are a little bit different because, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I should say no, but um, typically I haven't. And so this is one of the things that um, I'm really glad that I said, well, let's try it. So we did. And yeah, had no idea. <laughs> so. so how do you think it's the program's making a difference? Well, I think it just does really, I think, improve the outcomes for the kids that are participating in the program. And I think another thing is that it helps them not feel so isolated because they may go to school and they may not know of, um, you know, they may feel like that they're the only one there who's um, dead has gone to jail or, you know, that their grandmother's in jail or whatever the case may be. So whenever they come together, they can understand that there are other, there are other kids there that are in the same situation as them. Um, you know, nobody ever really talks about it because when you're at the prison, that's obvious, but um, they also, um, you know, they can kind of get involved in some other 4-H things. And we've had pretty good success of um, having kids go on state 4-H trips, um, go to camp, uh, get involved in their local 4-H programs and that kind of thing. And really that's um, one of our goals, um, even though they consider what happens in the prison visiting room, that is 4-H to them, that's their 4-H club. 
and um, and we're really happy whenever they go ahead and uh, take advantage of some of these other opportunities. Well, then I, I want to thank you so much for the work that you do and for joining us on the podcast. I want to remind people, just search 4-H Life or 4-H Life Missouri. Uh, look at the website, watch some of the videos on there, and I think you'll see the power of this of this program as uh, the videos of some of the offenders and the families are just uh, so powerful. So thanks for your work and thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Uh, Linda Lawson is a state 4-H youth development specialist with the 4-H Center for Youth Development at the University of Missouri, and she helps lead 4-H Life program for children of offenders and their families. You've been listening to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Please reach out to us. Let us know that you're listening. Let us know what you like or don't like about the podcast. You can reach us on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT. Check out the show notes at Bob Birch dot com and give us your feedback there as well. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.